Concerts are incredible experiences. And, and they've been getting better every year. And, and you have projection mapping and wristbands and, and screens. And everything has been evolving in the past few decades, except for one thing. Tickets. Ticketmaster reporting 3.5 billion total system requests, causing the site to crash. What the actual f is going on? Ticketmaster released a statement claiming that there was an unprecedented number of fake tickets, which caused confusion. The latest Ticketmaster fiasco has brought to light a company that has managed to slip through every regulation crack to build what can only be called an illegal monopoly. And Swifties managed to get a lot of attention. Things are moving forward to do something about it, but we seem to have forgotten that this has happened before. Pearl Jam has accused Ticketmaster of being a monopoly. It is this incestuous relationship and the lack of any national competition for Ticketmaster that has created the situation we're dealing with today. It's happened plenty of times, and every single time Ticketmaster has won the battle. We can defer in our political opinions, we can debate on free markets and, and tax structure, but there are few things that every lawmaker around the world can agree on. And this is one of them, that monopolies are bad. 99 times out of 100, competition works. When it doesn't, the government steps in to prevent monopolistic attempts. Amazon has violated antitrust laws. The U.S. Department of Justice has filed its first ever antitrust lawsuit against Google. The Federal Trade Commission suing to break up Facebook. The Justice Department has launched an antitrust investigation after the Taylor Swift ticketing debacle. This monopoly is the reason why things don't get better, because Ticketmaster has such dominion that even even with their exorbitant fees, their, their harassment of artists, their ticket overbooking, their price surges, nobody can compete and then there's no pressure to fix it. They are an illegal company. But to understand how a company managed to get to this, we need to understand Ticketmaster from its very origins. Humble, believe it or not. We need to understand monopolies. We need to understand why, despite dozens of laws written exactly to stop this from happening, how lawmakers don't seem to understand how to use them or when to use them. Ticketmaster is the perfect example of a company allowed to grow unchecked. A company that circumvented laws until it reached a scale that has left everyone powerless to stop it. There's nothing artists, producers, or venues can do anymore, let alone fans. It's a story that spans almost half a century from the very origins of live music. This is the company forensics of Ticketmaster. Now, before we go on, we need to talk about today's sponsor. You're gonna see in a minute that this Ticketmaster chaos is 30 years in the making. Its first major lawsuit was by the band Pearl Jump in 94. And this price gouging is not just affecting concerts, it's extended to medicine, energy, groceries, this list goes on. Everywhere you look, someone is squeezing a few more dollars out of you, out of people. And if you try to invest your and protect your Ducats last year, chances are you got buried. However, if you invested with Masterworks, you may have somewhat been spared. Masterworks is this game-changing fintech startup. And there are neighbors in the New York City Financial District, and they're changing the way we invest because they're just not offering uh, volatile assets like stocks or, or cryptocurrency. They're offering you a chance to invest in shares of authentic, high-end, contemporary, physical art. And in the last 12 months, when the stock market was having this historical bad year, Masterworks had nine sales for nine, 10, 13, 17, 21, 27, 33, 35, and 36%. And they returned over $25 million in net returns to their investors. The results caught the eye of outlets like CNBC and Forbes and the New York Times, and demand is surging with over 600,000 people signed up right now, many of them on a wait list. Now, Slipein subscribers can skip that wait list and claim a free, no obligation account at the link in the description. Now let's get to the video. Ticketmaster is almost as old as concerts themselves, at least in how we understand a concert today. The concert, the modern concert, actually originated around the Second World War. During that war and, and the Korean War and Vietnam, soldiers needed entertainment. And then advancements in speakers, audio equipment started turning these live events into more of a spectacle. And that spilled from the military into the civilian world. For music fans in the 50s, live music was about to be revolutionized. That's because in the 60s, this happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you. Tomorrow I'll miss you. 
During that decade, concerts became an art form and live music would never be the same. Artists were breaking rules and outdoing themselves in ways that nobody at the time could have imagined. These bands essentially set the stage for what we understand today as a concert. But this particular concert in 1977 would redefine everything. Concerts were evolving, yes, but one thing had not changed in a decade. Going to a concert had this inherent sense of drama because you had to buy a ticket. How long were you in line? I was here since six o'clock yesterday night. And tickets at this point were sold via booths or via telemarketers. And since the early days, you had scalpers. But through the 60s and 70s, something was different about the tickets that those fans were buying. If the fan experience was bad, the band experience was, was chaos. A band had to organize all the concerts themselves, talk to each venue, negotiate with them how to sell the tickets. Band managers also needed someone to spread the word in each city. That means that they had to hire local promoters to do marketing and promote the concert. And the deal in this era looked something like this. Now imagine having to go and do this in every city, in every country for your world tour. And then, of course, a 1969 company saw an opportunity and started offering to solve all of these things for a fee. And that's how Ticketron was born. In 69, it became the first successful electronic ticketing company in the US. By the late 70s, it had 600 outlets, places where it sold tickets, and it was dominating the live event market up until that New Mexico concert that we were just talking about. Now, Ticketmaster had humble beginnings in Arizona, out of all places. It's, of course, not the entertainment capital of the world, but before it became the monster company that it is today, Ticketmaster was at that point very much a tech startup, like us. Peter Gatwa, who was a programmer, and Albert Leffler, who was a box office specialist, they created this software and this hardware for ticketing systems. And their business model at the time was very simple and not evil at all. They just sold the devices and they charged a fee per ticket sold. And things were going good, so they decided to sell the company to the Pritzkers family. This is It's this wealthy American family from Chicago that has owned Hyatt Hotels and Braniff Airways and Royal Caribbean Cruises. Anyway, they of course wanted to take this company that they had just acquired into a whole new level. And they started by making this guy CEO. Now under Rosen's leadership, Ticketmaster moved to LA where they would start to battle Ticketron head to head. By 82, Ticketmaster was operating in 30 cities, including cities in Canada and in Europe. And Ticketron was just as massive. But the guys from Ticketmaster had an edge. Both companies were already streamlining the whole ticket process. They were cutting middlemen, but Ticketmaster was able to beat Ticketron by hustling more. Truly, Rosen, the CEO, he wanted domination, so Ticketmaster went all out to land any deal they could. For example, in 1980, he was negotiating the ticketing processing for the world-famous LA Forum. It's a huge deal, obviously, but the forum needed an extra service. They needed someone that could help them with the daily, the daily boring stuff, actually running, managing the venue. And of course, the Ticketron team dismissed this. It's not their core business, but Rosen didn't. He even offered to handle the forum's accounting. But by going this extra mile, by agreeing to do more for these venues, Ticketmaster landed partnerships with cinemas and stadiums and even specific shows such as the LA Philharmonic. By 1985, Ticketmaster was selling $40 million a year. By 91, it had finally outperformed Ticketron. It had gone public, it owned more market, and then in 92, it just bought them out. Now, when very large companies merge or, or they get acquired, the US and many countries around the world have laws and processes in place to review if those mergers are fair. In the United States, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is responsible for reviewing and approving these mergers to see if that would create a, a company that's too large or too powerful in, in a specific market. Because for a company to completely own a market is illegal. This is blocked by a set of rules that in the US they call the antitrust laws. For example, just really just a couple weeks ago, the FTC blocked Microsoft from acquiring gaming company Activision. The FTC suing Microsoft to officially block its planned deal with Activision. Because it would create an unfair unbalance in this gaming market. And so this requirement, this review exists to protect consumers and it was there, it existed in 92, and they did it. The FTC reviewed this merger and they approved it. They said something like, well, uh, the combined company would not have significant market power in the ticketing industry. And so with Ticketmaster merged and more powerful than ever, we come into the 90s.
this incredible era for live music where live spectacles consolidated finally and got bigger than ever. At this point, Ticketmaster was already bullying bands into accepting their own terms, including their insane ticket fees. The Grateful Dead, Pearl Jam, R.E.M., a lot of other bands, they tried to boycott Ticketmaster by selling their own tickets and refusing to play at venues that were operated by Ticketmaster. And it rose, really for the first time ever, this widely covered discussion about how powerful Ticketmaster was. One of the country's hottest rock bands went before Congress Thursday to explain why it's not playing any concerts this summer. The charges that the band claimed were so exorbitant they were forced to cancel their summer tour rather than gouge their fans. This summer we just decided that you know, we didn't want the ticket prices to be over $20. Many Pearl Jam fans are teenagers who do not have the money to pay $30 or more that it's often charged for tickets today. It sparked alarms about their monopolistic practices, but nothing happened. There was a lot of media attention at the time, but the FTC didn't get involved and nothing changed. Bands had to just fall back in line because more and more venues were operated by Ticketmaster and they just had no choice. There was no way out. Ticketmaster had made it abundantly clear that if you wanted to fight them, you were going to lose. And then of course, a little invention was about to change everything once again. Internet. The internet. 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 It is called internet. Can you explain what internet is? Internet is a... It's a series of tubes. With some vision of, of what the internet could do for Ticketmaster, Paul Allen, who's Microsoft's co-founder, bought 80% of the company, and unlike others, they kept it as a public company. And so, as concerts continued to consolidate in the 90s, they became a true revenue source for producers, for managers, for artists, and Ticketmaster was there taking percentages of each and every single ticket sold. And moreover, another middleman was cut around this time because you could now buy tickets online. So that's another person out of the chain. Through the 90s, Ticketmaster continued to buy companies while still lobbying to avoid any prying eyes on their very big but not monopoly operation. An operation that by the year 2000 sold 80% of the concert tickets in the US. Now, while we were all having fun at that Oasis concert, I'm kidding, of course, I've never been to one because I was too young. Anyway, another startup was in the works, probably the most critical one in this story. This is Robert Sillerman. Robert F.X. Sillerman, welcome to Theater Talk. Who's Bob Sillerman? A businessman in New York that had owned and operated radio stations since the 70s. But on Broadway, Bob, you are known as the man who came up with a $450 ticket. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he had built relationships and connections in the industry. He founded this company called SFX Entertainment, which did exactly that. They promoted live events. Electric Daisy Carnival and, and Tomorrowland were both events created by SFX. And so this company, Clear Channel acquired it, they separated again, and just ignore it, we were just cutting to 2005, it became Live Nation. It still promoted concerts, but its main business was owning or managing venues. And not just any venue, we're talking about some of the most iconic venues around the world. And so these guys, of course, had to work closely with Ticketmaster. They understood how much money Ticketmaster made. They even tried to build a competing product, but it didn't work out. And so it was just too obvious, right? Like. What if these two companies joined forces? This combined company will make it impossible for new competitors in ticketing or concert promotion to emerge and that consumers will pay higher prices as a result. All right, so here we are again. It's 2009, 17 years later. There's another Ticketmaster merger coming. And once again, the FTC needs to review this transaction to make sure that it doesn't break the monopoly laws. And these are laws, not guidelines. And in a super summarized nutshell, a monopoly will exist when four factors are met. First, single seller. That means that there's only one seller in the market and that the seller controls the supply and the demand of that product and service. Second, no close substitutes. That means that customers have no other options to buy. There's a unique seller that you need to purchase that product or service from. Next up, barriers of entry. Those are barriers that prevent any other firm from entering the market and competing with that existing company. They could be legal or economical or technological. And last but not least, price makers. That's when a company becomes the company that can set the price without regard to the actions of other firms because they just don't have any competition. I mean, I don't know, but this very much looks like the Live Nation and Ticketmaster merger was going to establish a monopoly. Live Nation controlled venues would only sell tickets via Ticketmaster, and that is a lot of venues. And I haven't even talked about sports, and I'm not going to, because who makes a video on YouTube that's over 30 minutes? It would, be, it would be too long. And it's not just me saying this 14 years later. 
Flags were raised at the time. Artists rose concerns about how this massive company could change the entire landscape of live events and tickets, but this all fell on deaf ears. Live Nation and Ticketmaster provided all the documentation, all the paperwork, and they pinky swore that they were not a monopoly. Because there were other competitors out there, you had StubHub and Eventbrite, but none of them really operated venues, and none of them sold nearly as many tickets as Ticketmaster was already selling. But somehow, through lobbying, and honestly at this point, we are not really sure why, the FTC approved this deal. And that gets us to now. Now, Spotify might have made our, our lives, our music listening easier. Go watch a video about them, but it's a really bad time to be an artist. <laughs> In the 2000s, you had to pay for each song, part of a CD, part of a tape, part of an MP3, each song was a monetary transaction. On iTunes, maybe 99 cents, 70 cents that went completely to the record company. Now, of course, record companies keep most of that 70 cents, but that's, that's a story for another day. The point is, we were dealing with 70 cents per song, not too different from CDs in the 90s. But this is how much the rights holder of a song gets per stream on Spotify. That means 100,000 streams, 500 bucks at best. So live music, live music was supposed to be the answer to all of this, a new revenue stream for artists. After all, millennials, we want to pay for experiences, not for physical things. But there's only one way to do this, and it's by giving most of our money to one company. Because as of today, Live Nation controls 70% of the tickets sold in the US, and they run 80% of the music venues in the country. It's as simple as that. If you want to run a concert in those venues, you have to go through Ticketmaster. So in truth, there's no other choice. And that's what's going on. There is a monopoly. Let's look at how a ticket sale breaks down and how much of that money is going to Ticketmaster today. Say for the latest Taylor Swift concert, the average ticket price was $215. That's actually a 20% average increase from pre-COVID. And then, yeah, we saw those $20,000 tickets, but I'm gonna get there in a minute. In 2022, on average, Ticketmaster added 78% of the ticket in fees. Notice how that has evolved from 2009 when the monopoly started. On a Taylor Swift ticket, using that range, that's $168 for Ticketmaster and just $68 for Taylor Swift and the rest of the production and the team. And it doesn't stop with the exorbitant ticket fees. In the last few years, Ticketmaster has implemented two pretty greedy systems to maximize their revenue. And one of them is dynamic pricing. Ticketmaster calls this scheme dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing. A system already used by airlines and ride sharing services. Think something like Uber price surges, but for concert tickets. If the demand for the tickets is high, the ticket prices will go I up. I mean, you could argue that's more money going to the artists, no? I mean, the argument behind this whole thing is that without dynamic pricing, tickets will be snatched anyway and resold and the artists wouldn't make any money from that. So just let the artists take that cash. <laughs> I mean, no? say what you will. I mean, th this is what cost Bruce Springsteen's tickets to skyrocket to $5,000 per ticket because of this surge in demand. Also, this is an opt-in, by the way. It's not that every band is automatically assigned to this. Bands actually have to enable this feature for their concerts. And the truth is, these days, most bands do. Now, an even shadier practice by Ticketmaster is getting into the secondary market of tickets, reselling tickets. So in 2021, people spent $1 billion in resale tickets. It's a very real, very profitable market. And Ticketmaster, of course, won it in. So in 2013, they acquired the company CrowdSource precisely because of this. And while there are other players in the market, Ticketmaster has also an unfair advantage to want more of these resold tickets. Simple reason, they make a whole lot more money from a resold ticket compared to a regular ticket. In a resale, they not only made their original fees, but then they charge fees on top of that to the seller and to the buyer in that secondary market. And those fees don't have to be shared with the venues or with the production or with anyone. They're pure, direct, full 100% profit revenue for Ticketmaster. And it's also a massive conflict of interest. This, the company that's selling the primary market tickets also sells the secondary market tickets. It's such a conflict that Taylor Swift intentionally and you know with, with certain leveraging power, she was able to forbid that happening with Ticketmaster. So she doesn't allow the same company to sell the primary and the secondary tickets, which sounds logical, but it's by no means the norm for other artists. And if you really wanna make things worse, how about overbooking a venue by accidentally selling duplicate tickets? That's Bad Bunny in Mexico, where at least 1,600 tickets were bought on the platform directly from the original primary sale 
and had duplicate QR codes. No me This is a monopoly. Make no mistake, this is an illegal monopoly. No wonder the company spent $1.2 million, self-reported, in lobbying efforts to avoid any antitrust scrutiny. And what can we do? The short answer is nothing. <laughs> Pearl Jam couldn't, and it's unlikely that Swifties will be able to do anything about it this time. History tells us this is just a PR mess that'll just fly by in a couple of weeks. Even the government is hands tied to act at this point because antitrust laws have existed. They've existed for over a century and they've, they've dismantled some big names, but the real opportunity to do it is before the merger and that didn't happen. I'm no legal expert and really this video doesn't intend to be that, but the actual document from the justice department that the government should use to determine if a company is, is, is a monopoly or not, it, it contradicts itself. It sets the market share range to determine a monopoly is anywhere from 50 to 80%. So which is it? Ticketmaster is well above this in many aspects. The millions of dollars that will continue to be used to defend their case is not shrinking. As it stands today, we live in a world where artists desperately need what Ticketmaster gives them. Nobody else can compete and we, the fans, we're just stuck in the middle. But there might be a sign of hope. Taylor Swift's persistency paid off and led to an avalanche of criticism towards Live Nation and Ticketmaster. And it even led to a probe from the government. And Ticketmaster has its back against the wall this time. Ticketmaster ought to look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. It's me. And they're even struggling to defend their own technology to prevent scalping. If you got a scalper trying to buy 2,000 tickets, they don't want 2,000 tickets, they want a profit. And in the end, this is a glimmer of hope. And it's not only about Ticketmaster, but will this change actually happen? I have popcorn to, to read what you have to say in the comments. See you next week.